Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you again to our lecture series, The United States and World Affairs, The Cold War and Beyond. I'm Klaus Laris and I'm the Richard M. Krasner Distinguished Professor in History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. As always, I would like to thank Richard Kresner and the generous sponsors behind the Kresner Distinguished <coughs> Professorship for making possible this lecture series on the United States and World Affairs. I would also like to thank the Department of History and our Center for European Studies for all their support for this lecture series. In a few days' time, the lecture today uh, will be available on our YouTube channel and also on the UNC website. All our previous talks, such as the ones by Bill Lachtenberg and by Michael Hunt recently, and also the talks in our Ambassadors Forum can be viewed on our great YouTube channel. Please do not forget to go into it and click on it. We need um, as many clicks as possible. And please watch all of them intensively and several times. <laughs> today it is a particular great pleasure and a great honor to welcome Professor Frank Costigliola today. Um, Frank is one of the nation's leading and most important international historians. He is a professor at the University of Connecticut and a former president of the Society uh, for Historians of American Foreign Relations, or in the abbreviation Schaefer. At present, he is editing the diaries of George F. Kennan, which cover around about 20,000 pages and the years from 1924 to 2004, and thus most of the 20th century. I understand Frank has just sent the manuscript to the publishers. Frank has received numerous distinguished awards and fellowships from, for instance, the Guggenheim Foundation, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the, uh, the Norwegian Nobel Institute, and many, many others. In his work, Frank focuses on the political and cultural aspects of international relations during the interwar period, during the Second World War, and of course, during the Cold War. He has also written on methodological questions regarding the writing of contemporary history. Among Frank's many publications are Roosevelt's Lost Alliances, How Personal Politics Helped Start the Cold War, and that book came out in 2012. It is about to be issued in paperback and should be in all the bookstores soon. Feel free to go out and buy lots of copies, please. I'm sure Frank would be grateful. <laughs> Among Frank's other books are, for example, Awkward Dominion, American Political, Economic and Cultural Relations with Europe uh, from 1919 to 1933, that has all just come out or recently come out in 2010 in a new edition. He also wrote, for example, France and the United States, The Cold Alliance Since World War II. On a personal note, I would like to add that Frank and I seem to have first met at Cologne University in the late 1980s when I was a budding doctoral student there. I was highly impressed, of course, when Frank talked to us as a visiting professor. Today, Frank Costigliola will talk about George Kennan and Russia. To be more precise, he will talk about the <coughs> processes of thought in George Kennan's imagining of Russia. There will be time for questions afterwards. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure and a great honor <coughs> to present Professor Frank Costigliola to you today. Thank you, Klaus, for that very generous uh, introduction. I don't think the book's going to be in all the bookstores, um, <laughs> but uh, it'll be on Amazon. OK, um, so I apologize for the title of the talk, the thought process. Is, it's precise. It's inelegant. Unlike Kennan, it's in inelegant. But I think it's, it's a precise kind of title. My mental processes will never be understood by anyone else. George F. Kennan, the author of The Cold War Doctrine of Containment, concluded in 1932. He never gave up, however, on trying to make his mental processes understandable to others as well as to himself. Throughout his 101-year life, this moody, quirky, contemplative, perceptive, and unevenly brilliant diplomat and critic monitored his emotions and those of others. He endorsed Virginia Woolf's insight that the so-called economic and political realities mask a more genuine world shaped by jealousies, loves, passions, and rare flashes of insight. He understood that emotions imbue life with meaning, purpose, and structure. Kennan aimed to contain and channel such feelings, not only, not only the desires that buffeted his own life, but also the sentiments that he believed swayed foreign policy. <laughs> Intent on persuading others through the force of language, his elegant, lang elegant language, Kennan packaged emotional rhetoric in elegant style. 
The more outraged I become, he explained, the better I do. His famous manifestos, such as the Long Telegram of 1946 and Mr. X article of 1947, crackled with emotion even as they appealed to ostensible reason and realism. Having read Sigmund Freud in the 1930s, Kennan adopted a lifelong belief in such tenets as infantile sexuality and the inescapable conflict between what he called, and what Freud called, libido and civilization. Yet he also, yet he also d disparaged psychoanalysis as escapism for the weak-willed. In the 1980s, Kennan maintained an enthusiasm for Freudian-inspired, supposedly scientific psychohistory, even, even after that approach was abandoned by nearly all historians. Though Kennan remained intellectually aware almost until his death in 2005, he did not comment on the pivot beginning in the 1990s toward neuroscience as a fresh positivist grounding for emotions history. The historiog historiography emerging for what some have called a new emotional turn premises that emotions are necessary rather than antithetical to rational thought. The second premise is that while rational and emotional impulses originate in different areas of the brain, they emerge as integrated thought, which is expressed through culturally inflected language and gestures. Neurobiological evidence concludes that human beings are not entirely rational creatures or actors. Feelings influence behavior even when people, including policymakers and scholars, believe they are acting in a totally rational manner. Historians studying the emotions do not need special training, I believe, in neuroscience or in psychology. Rather, they need to read a variety of texts carefully and take seriously such evidence as discussion of emotion, words signifying emotion, evoking emotion provoking tropes, visual and other sensory cues, habitual behaviors, excited behaviors, ironies, silences, and the cultural context, I want to stress that, in the cultural context of these and other emotional expressions. <coughs> of course, emotional expression is only an indication of emotional states. It's even harder to get at. Despite the growing focus on emotions in history, I would suggest that that focus is, too, is still too narrow. In seeking a deeper understanding of motives, historians, I believe, need also to circle back to a more holistic conception that includes not only emotions, but also other aspects of thought and the impact of personality. Toward that end, I want this afternoon to examine not only Kennan's emotions, but also the parameters of his personality and the modes of his cognition, and namely in terms of those modes of cognition, uh, what I have in mind here is analysis, sensory perception, engagement, and intuition. From these interdependent, and I stress the interdependent, from these interdependent elements of thought emerge Kennan's imagining of Russia, a country that engaged his deepest passions. During the confusion and turmoil of 1945-47, when US attitudes toward the Soviet Union pivoted between the wartime alliance and the Cold War, Kennan ranked first among the nation's Soviet experts. No other diplomat could match his years of experience in Moscow or his deep knowledge of Russia. Nor, as Kennan proudly claimed, could there be anyone in the Western world who has deeper feelings than I do for the qualities of the Russian people. He hoped, indeed he fantasized, that his longing for a transcendence and inclusion could be satisfied by sustained contact with the people, culture, and land of Russia. That passion was frustrated by the Kremlin's policy of isolating foreign representatives from the Soviet people. The resulting anguish and fury influenced, as Kennan acknowledged, his political analysis. His long telegram galvanized top officials of the Truman administration, while his Mr. X article the following year grabbed the attention of the educated public. In 1945-47, Kennan psychologized and, therefore, and thereby helped emotionalize the political and ideological challenge of the Kremlin. Kennan insisted that the psychosis of the Soviet Union, and he used that word, the psychosis of the Soviet Union and its Leninist, Marxist-Leninist ideology precluded any compromise with the United States. Ever ambitious, he depicted Russia as so psychologically maimed that relations with it could be managed only by a few trained experts, such as himself. The threat, he said, was frightfully complicated, was a frightfully complicated, involved thing, he told the public audience. 
Russia is at least a dual personality, and sometimes I think quadruple or more, whatever that means. Kennett urged neither war nor appeasement, what he called appeasement, but rather a middle path of political containment. His intervention in the policy debate of 1945-47 helped propel the United States, already primed to resist Soviet advances, into the Cold War. As the Cold War took off, an alarmed Kennan tried to pull back. As early as February 1948, he was urging the State Department to consider reopening negotiations with Stalin. And laying out the qualifications for the official who should conduct such talks, Kennan described himself. As ambassador to the Soviet Union in 1952, Kennan wanted so desperately to ease the Cold War that he ended up worsening international tensions, wrecking his diplomatic career, and getting himself expelled from the country that he loved. By the late 1950s, the former Cold Warrior had emerged, had merged as an impassioned public critic of the conflict he'd helped launch. These apparent swings in policy reflected underlying consistencies in Kennan's personality, in his ways of knowing Russia, and in his emotional identification as Russian as well as American. Discourses of psychology shaped Kennan's notions about himself and about international relations. <coughs> While vocalizing focused thought, as he did when formulating telegrams or when talking with his biographer, he often lay down on the sofa to dictate, almost like a patient in a psychiatrist's office, his secretary later testified. That he could slip into the position of an, an alisand is not surprising given his, given his lifelong interest in psychological phenomena. In 1935, while recuperating in Vienna from a physical and mental collapse suffered in Russia, Kennan befriended a medical physician, Frieda Poor, who espoused Freud. I didn't accept Freudianism entirely, he would later recall. I thought this was the Jewish part of her. I said to her, you know, your idea of what to do with a patient who has problems like this is to wrap them in soft blankets and tell them not to be ashamed of anything. He preferred instead the Puritan tradition, which is that you jolly well bite the bullet if you have problems. Kennett incorporated into his version of the Puritan tradition a lifelong belief in the iron dilemma spelled out in Freud's civilization and its discontents. Whether Kennan was preparing a, a talk in the 1950s to Princeton undergraduates on what I believe, or critiquing a draft of a book by Reinhold Niebuhr, Kennan proceeded from the same premise, and I'm quoting him now. At the center of our psychic construction is a libido, the demands of which, as Freud has demonstrated, we ignore at our peril. War, warring at war with the instinct to, pro, to reproduce were the taboos and penalties of civilization. If a man, and Kennan nearly always, always regarded the male gender as a normative one, if a man were caught between the cogs of nature and those of society, he would be rubbed to pieces. Kennan reminded Princeton students that in the era of Moses, the commandment against adultery envisioned, envisioned, uh, envisioned uh, marriage as a polygamous affair and women as slaves. The commandment, he said, was easier to observe when you had 35 of them. <laughs> More than sexual freedom was at stake, however, for Kennan. Kennan saw the libido as the control switch for youthful vitality and intellectual and aesthetic creativity. While inciting chaos, the erotic forces also provided escape from the death trap of everyday existence. He feared, he feared that in upholding the laws of society, in particular his dignity as a husband, a father, and an official, he was also condemning himself to an early acceptance of death, a renunciation of his own life. Russia appeared, Russia appeared as a salvation from this terrible dilemma. Returning to Moscow in 1944 after a seven year absence, the diplomat was fascinated with it, with Russia, every minute. I react intensely to everything I see and hear. Sensory and se sensual attraction drew him to the Russian people. He loved to rub elbows with them in the streets to smell the earthy, almost touching smells which characterized them. He wrote that their tremendous pulsating warmth and vitality filled me with an indescribable sort of satisfaction. Cannon, who often felt estranged from Americans, fantasized about inclusion with Russians. 
He said he would prefer to dwell in Siberia among them than to live in Park Avenue among our own stuffy folk. Kennan believed that if only he could get deeper into Russia, I'm quoting him now, if only he could get deeper into Russia, he might finally arrive face to face with that indefinable something so full of promising meaning, meaning that I have always felt to be just around the corner. Before him shimmered something so wonderful it was literally indefinable. But such fulfillment was denied him. The Kremlin, the, the isolation, the isolation from the Russian people imposed by the Kremlin meant I will never be able to become a part of them, he concluded in 1944. That disappointment struck as the last and most crucial of many frustrations. It signified that the peak of my life was definitely past. Kennan, who for years had fretted about losing his youth, had just turned 40. Now robbed of any hope for some unfolding of the mystery, he had to settle for such modest comforts as one can from the remaining years of life. Such gloom notwithstanding, Kennan and the following ensuing six decades, uh, six days after the supposed peak of life, would gain extraordinary respect as a diplomat, policy planner, historian, Vietnam War critic, anti-nuclear activist, pioneering environmentalist, and public intellectual. Yet he would never escape feeling caught between dull responsibility and delicious transcendence. Partly because he viewed his own life as a psychological drama, Kennan welcomed the turn toward psychohistory in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Kennan urged his authorized biographer, John Lewis Gaddis, to keep in mind the importance of psychology, the psychological dimension, even psychobiography. In this connection, Kennan believed that the death of his mother only two months after his birth had scarred him for life. In his dream, she appeared as an alluring figure, younger than I had thought of her as being, with intense eyes and a sensitive, sometimes slightly pouting mouth. She seemed a real human being, not the angel I had always pictured. His stepmother, by contrast, was really cruel, he would complain, even as a man in his late 70s. Kennan's recounting a pivotal childhood incident at two key moments in his life, a half century apart, underscores, I think, his lifelong belief in certain Freudian tenets. The first recounting was during his mental crisis in 1935, when he was trying to understand his own psyche. The second occasion came in 1982, when he was trying to make his biographer understand his psyche. As Kennan told the story, as Kennan told, told that, recounted the incident, incident as follows. As an eight-year-old boy walking with my stepmother in Germany, I had watched with a fierce childish jealousy the spectacle of a little German boy happily urinating with the tender cooperation of his mother in a public park. How I envied that intimacy, which made his mother a partner rather than an enemy in those forbidden things. The undertones here were obvious. While more fortunate little boys could be happy in the intimacy of urinating and tender cooperation with a loving mother, his stepmother had remained an enemy in those forbidden things. Kennan, Kennan, Kennan saw in this memory evidence, quote, about myself and my tendency toward inordinate eroticism, my seeking an erotic tinge in all sorts of things, including certain landscapes. Decades later, after 1935, almost a half century after 1935, in his first formal interview with John Lewis Gaddis, Kennan suddenly switched topics to blurt out, I was affected neurotically by the absence of a mother. He then related a somewhat expurgated version of the story that I, that I read to you a minute ago. Kennan dreamt that he was searching for his mother in a crowd of Russian peasants, he also told Gaddis. The historian John Harper, borrowing from the uh, psycho psychological theorist Melanie Klein, has suggested that for Kennan, the loss of his mother, an unrelinquished object, predisposed his attraction to the culture of traditional Russia, which he imagined as nurturing and maternal. Regardless of the precise psychological basis, Kennan did regard the land and the people of Russia, though not the government, which he detested. He regarded the land and the people of Russia as alluringly feminine. He lauded the Russian church, which idealized the virgin for a centuries long tolerant maternal influence, as he put it. He admired what he called the powerful maternal thighs of the female Slav. He depicted the Russian populace 
the Soviet government and himself as locked in a tra tragic triangle which he figured as the true love of the Russian people. He compared those people to a beautiful lady guarded by a jealous lover in the Kremlin. While Kennan remained a fan of psychohistory, and by the early 1990s, that approach, that approach had been abandoned by nearly all historians. And it was abandoned because of his dogmatic, dogmatic Freudianism and exaggerated scientific pretensions. Psychohistory was also undermined by the rise of social history, which emphasized rational rather than emotional motivations among ordinary people. As gender history gained popularity, psychohistory and Freudian concepts in general seemed masculinist in an old-fashioned, musty kind of way. With psychohistory in, dis in disrepute by the early, uh, 1990s, historians looked to other scientific evidence for help in grasping slippery emotion. In the past 20 years, in the past, going back 20 years from now, uh, since in the last 20 years, neuroscientists have mapped how the various areas of the brain have reacted to stimuli. They have demonstrated that rational and emotional thought are integrated. Are integrated. Individuals with damage to the emotion processing parts of their brain also suffer impairment in their ability to make rational decisions. Rational decision making requires, requires emotional input. Despite the value of these findings by cognitive scientists and neuroscientists, I think historians also need to be careful not to be, not lest they fall into the positivist trap that they did with regard to psychohistory of seeking a, 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 a supposedly scientific uh, answer to getting at the slippery topic of emotions. Historians have also pushed back against the scientists' tendency to assume that thought is unchanging across time and across cultures. Though emotions are, are based in biology, they can be expressed only in an historical and cultural context. Feelings are filtered and interpreted through language, which is culturally specific, of course. Expressions of emotion are social interactions that reflect the degrees of variation, class, gender, and ethnic-based conventions. We can now circle back to the central narrative, narrative of, my of my talk by examining the elements in Kennan's knowledge of and fascination for Russia. While thought is integrated, historical analysis of it, I think, requires some schema, inevitably imperfect, of slicing and dicing. I would like to define cognition broadly so that it includes a biologically grounded sensory and limbic processing system of the emotions, as well as the culturally conditioned cortex-based articulations of conscious thought. What gave Kennan's thinking about Russia such uh, range was its grounding in four distinct yet overlapping ways of knowing, analysis, sensory perception, engagement, and intuition, all of them entailing emotional input and expression. His discernment was keenest when, the, when these cognitive <coughs> modes remained in balance. That requirement probably intensified Ken's desire for contact with the people, culture, and land of Russia. Kennan, as a diplomat, came to know Russia by investing long hours in his formidable intelligence and analyzing, in the context of his desire, the uh, official, economic, official economic reports, newspapers, and other written texts. He listened, watched, sniffed, tasted, and touched with a sensory perception so acute that it bordered on the supersensory. His friend Isaiah Berlin affirmed that nobody Nobody, Isaiah Berlin said, nobody in the Western world can detect, as you can, the spirit of Russia, the smells of old Russia. Kennan sought out immersive engagement in Russia. Even before first entering the Soviet Union in 1933, he experienced travel through the Latvian countryside as the purest Russia. I drink it all in, love it intensely, and feel myself for a time an inhabitant of that older pre-revolution Russia. Finally, Kennan relied on his hunches. To fellow Soviet expert Chip Bolin, he affirmed, how much is to be done in Moscow by sheer intuition. Kennan's famed expertise on Russia stemmed then from both earned capability and extrapolated claim. His cognition, filtered through his passion, yielded a mix of brilliant insight and skewed vision. 
Kevin even Kevin even identified himself as Russian. In 1958, years after he had left Moscow, seeing a London performance of Chekhov's play, The Cherry Orchard, stirred, he's writing now, stirred all the rusty, untuned strings of the past and of my own youth, Riga and the Russian landscape, and the staggering, unexpected familiarity and convincingness of the Chekhovian world. It stirred up, in other words, my Russian self, which is entirely a Chekhovian self, and much more genuine than the American one. And having all this prodded to the surface in me, I sat there in the theater, blubbering like a child, and trying desperately to keep the rest of the company from noticing it. Kenneth's emotional embrace of this identity, my Russian self, which is much more genuine than the American one, remained the focus of his life. As a diplomat in Moscow, he posed as a Chekhovian member of the gentry. He left to ride horseback through the countryside, and, and he recalled, that he made it a point of saying good day to all the peasants. They look as though they were seeing a ghost and grope uncertainly for their hats. They think maybe the revolution was all a bad dream and the masters are back in the saddle, which Ken of course is one of those masters. His desire for inclusion in Russia could trump for a moment even his distaste for the Kremlin regime. In 1945, a government official treated Kennan to a raucous night out on the town in Siberia. Kennan's recollection revealed his underlying ambivalence about the Soviet Union. You, you recall this, e uh, this evening. For one lovely evening, I was, to all intents and purposes, a member of the Soviet governing elite. In addition to this quest for immersion and intensity, a sense of destiny shaped Kennan's personality. And personality, Isaiah Berlin affirmed, is more important than what Kennan says or writes. Personality is what explains him. Proud of his intelligence, insight, and gift for expression, Kennan regarded himself as a superior person, Berlin observed. Kennan's persistent self-criticism was matched only by his relentless ambition. He wanted, among other things, to literally change U.S. society, to spur among Americans a greater respect for communitarian values, the environment, and leadership from talented persons such as himself. While still a junior diplomat, he mused that for generations, the Kennans had been breeding an excellent stock. We were all leading up to someone quite wonderful. While idealizing Russia, Kennan indicted 20th century America. I hate the rough and tumble of our political life. I hate the whole damn system. I hate democracy. I hate the press. I hate the people. I have become clearly un-American. He wrote that in the, in the 1930s. In the late 1950s, when he was a respected uh, professor at the Institute for Advanced Study, and after he had a very distinguished diplomatic career, he wrote in his diary uh, that he dared not disclose the depth of my estrangement, the depth of my repudiation of the things the American public lives by. Though Kennan preferred pre-1917 Russia, he also believed that aspects of even Soviet society offered answers to the superficiality, hyper-individualism, and commercialization that plagued the United States. This critical perspective focused Kennan's ambition. He mused he might become that wonderful someone that the Ken, of the Kennan clan that the Kennan clan had been leading toward by shepherding, shepherding an historic interaction with Russia could, that could help remake the United States. After his 1933-37 service in Moscow as a junior diplomat, Kennan renewed his hope that somewhere in that Russian world and the freshness and spontaneity of its human relationships and its childish, childishly, childishly blunt reaction to the problems of civilization and the warmth and beauty of its language, somewhere things could be found which would help us in solving the problems of our own American culture. If, however, there were no exciting answers to be sought in Russia, that placed a definite ceiling to my professional aspirations, to my conception of the potentialities of Soviet-American relations. So that was at the end of his 33 to 37 stint. Toward the end of his 1944 to 46 stint in Moscow, as number two to the ambassador, Avril Harriman, the breakdown of the wartime alliance lifted the ceiling from his aspiration, giving Kennan another chance to present Russia, this time in the form of the Soviet threat, as a prod for America to tackle its need for domestic reform. As the ambassador to Russia in 1952, Kennan, in vain, 
can and tried in vain to intervene in the Cold War so as to save both Russia and the United States from what he feared as a nuclear holocaust. Each of Kennan's three terms in Moscow proved intensely exciting and eventually excruciating. He loved to walk the crowded streets to argue with intellectuals and thereby engage with the sensuous, revitalizing energy of Russia. Thwarting this desire were the limits imposed by the Kremlin, the US government, and by his own constitution. His first tour in Russia sparked what Kennan himself acknowledged was a physical and mental breakdown in late 1934. <clears throat> His tenure as ambassador in 1952 led to mental strain and a lapse in judgment so serious that it might also qualify as a psychological collapse. The 1944-46 mission, he survived in better shape, but only by venting his frustration in two manifestos, the long telegram and the Mr. X article. Ambassador William Bullitt's invitation to Kennan in December 1933 to help set up the first U.S. Embassy in Moscow since Oh, the Russian Revolution. That invitation rescued the junior diplomat from a psychological dead end. Although Kennan in later decades would deny that Marxist theory had ever appealed to him, <clears throat> in 1932, that is the year before he went to Russia, he put forth a Marxian explanation for both the global economic depression and his own personal depression. He wrote, what had struck was not a crisis, but the crisis. Just as in the past there had always appeared new markets to absorb the flood of economic expansion, so too had his psyche always been lifted by new illusions and new hopes to absorb energy and attention, get to give the false sense of motion and direction. That is all changing now. The world is near, is, the world is at the end of its economic rope. I am at the end of my mental one. Before the invitation from Bullet, Kennan had concluded sadly that Russia is Russia is to me and will remain a forbidden world, and the iron reality of this realization has struck so deep that I am becoming indifferent to it, as we become indifferent to all things which we really want but cannot have. In other words, he thought he'd never be allowed to get into Russia, the United States would never recognize Russia. Something else Kennan could not have was peace from the conflict between obligation and libido, the conflict between his marriage and his personal pride and spirit, as he put it. Although he would remain emotionally attached to his Norwegian-born wife, Annalise Sorensen Kennan, for 73 years, he strayed often and he longed to do so even more, despite the ensuing guilt. <clears throat> Little more than a year after the wedding in 1931, he tried to convince himself the technique of marriage is nothing more or less than the art of dissimulation. Yet that sentiment did not sit completely well with him, and then he resolved to stop beating frantically against the bars of the cage. He would and he should remain faithful to his wife. And then in the same sentence he wrote, but yet faithfulness was a ridiculous and unhealthy ideal, entailing an acceptance of death. He views that if his wife had not been so dependent upon him, he would have probably committed suicide. Abandon these extramarital pursuits, the side of him demanded, this is all in his diary. Abandon these extramarital pursuits, the side of him demanded. But I would be almost crippled by this change, another inner voice protested. To which came the IC reply also from the inner, another inner voice. Invitations are always crippling. Bullet's invitation for Kennan to accompany him to Moscow offered a possible release from this terrible dilemma. Kennan imagined the people, land, and culture of Russia as a rejuvenating well of creativity, sensuality, and intellectual and aesthetic stimulation. Russia offered the possibility of not just sexual satisfaction, but also, and probably more importantly, transcendence from the everyday into some wonderful mystery tinged with maternal love. Kennan first entered Russia on December 10th, 1933. And he, he wrote with regard to it. Too excited to sleep, I sat through the night, scratching the frost up off the window pane staring out at the crowds on the little station platforms. With an orientalist perspective, he beheld, the he beheld the spectacle of Russia, Russia, unwashed, backward, appealing Russia. So ashamed of your own backwardness, so orientally determined to conceal it from us by clever deceit, so sensitive and so suspicious in the face of the wicked, civilized West. 
indicating the bent of his own desire, can in juxtapose appealing with unwashed and backward. Throughout his life, he would cringe at slick urbanity while extolling life on the land and the gritty labor it required. The diplomat assumed, a, in this quotation, assumed a dual authoritative gaze. Authoritative gaze. He was both the Westerner passing judgment and the Oriental concealing his nation's supposed deficiencies. The ensuing 12 months in Russia, from December 33 to December 34, was a period so exciting that Kennedy could neither repeat nor forget those months. Life approached the true bohem. Parties were not given, they developed. I loved it. I felt at home with these people, he remarked, uh, remarked Kennedy, who really felt at home back in America. Soviet officials were delighted by young Kennedy, Bullock reported to Washington. The young diplomat plunged into the excitement and dizziness of Moscow, as he put it. Although Kennedy in 1946-47 would depict the Soviet system as an existential threat, <clears throat> in 1934 he found aspects of it that seemed attractive. He contrasted the stark realities of Soviet life with the neurotic unreality of our own. Soviet society glowed with something unmistakably healthy, not the health we strive for by the elimination of microbes and danger and physical hardship, but rather an earthy vitality, uh, bred by having survived the ruthless natural selection enforced by the revolution and the Civil War. The relatively liberated gender relations then prevailing in Moscow in the early 1930s strengthened Kennan's critique of what he called bourgeois marriage. Promising that he had not gone Bolshevist, he nonetheless proclaimed that the family must disappear as an ideal of human happiness. For a very stuffy, selfish one, it is. The principle of permanent and possessive intimacy must give way to something resembling, aside from sexual relationships, the attitude of college roommates toward each other. The diplomat and social theorist did not elaborate on how couples in this environment could maintain monogamy, and it seems fair to conclude that he did not regard that requirement as a pressing one. Although Kennan in his diary and letters remained vague about his own sexual activities, he could not have been indifferent to the sexual playground that was the U.S. Embassy. As a colleague, Charlie Thayer later reminisced, uh, he later reminisced, Thayer later reminisced about the not entirely sane existence we led with misses and mistresses altogether in an alcoholic haze. <clears throat> As 1934 progressed, Kennedy's life grew, he wrote, terribly strenuous. Moscow had me somewhat on the run, he would later acknowledge. I was too fascinated by Russia. He chafed under the compulsion to political inactivity, self-restraint, and objectivity mandated by his positions as, US, as a U.S. official and by his marriage. These limits, he feared, were rendering, rendering him sterile. In a diary entry scrawled in Russian, he lamented, I am among the Russians, like one who has to wear a mask among his own children. The metaphor suggest, for, suggested frustration that his duties were forcing him to conceal his true Russian identity from his real Russian kin. What Kennett later termed his nervous strain, his nervous strain built until December 12, 1934, precisely a year after he had first arrived in Moscow, when he was felled by an attack of ulcers, ulcers but his, doc his doctor would diagnose severe physical and nervous strain after service in Russia. Something had snapped, Kennan later explained, and he felt relief that this was the end. The collapse was both physical and mental. Assigned by the State Department to a months long cure at a sanitarium in Vienna, he felt out of place, even depressed, he wrote, in this bourgeois environment. The 31-year-old des despaired, I won't alter the world after all. Although asserting that he was no Bolshevik, <clears throat> he praised some of the visions of the more intelligent communist leaders in Russia <clears throat> as having offered the most compelling and inspiring conceptions that I have ever encountered. Stalin's, pur Stalin's purge of most of those inspirational figures would poison Kennan's perspective on the Kremlin's domestic and foreign policies. On December 1st, 1934, coincidentally 11 days before Kennan's collapse, Kirov, Stalin's long-time long -time comrade and potential rival, was assassinated. The dictator seized the opportunity to launch purges destroying that eventually destroyed most of the leadership of the Communist Party and the Red Army. Nearly all of Kennan's Russian friends would perish, and those surviving would be too intimidated to talk with foreigners. 
Although Kennan returned to Russia in November 1935, he'd been gone for like 11 months, <clears throat> he found that he wrote practically impossible to have anything to do whatsoever with the Russian because of all these limitations being imposed by the secret police. Stalin's terror inflicted traumatic stress on Kennan and on his other diplomatic colleagues. Worn down, Kennan scrawled in his diary, hard and perturbing day at the office, arrests and demotions, arrests and demotions. He was paying the most minute attention to the grotesque show trial of Karl Radek, the former Bolshevik hero and a favorite sparring partner of Kennan, Kennan and Long of uh, all night discussions. Acquaintances, friends, lovers, and even wives were disappearing. Gone were the opportunities to mingle, argue, imagine, love, and learn. This emotional pain proved transformative. Berlin, Isaiah Berlin remembered Kennan as terribly absorbed, personally involved somehow, in the terrible nature of the Stalin regime. Decades later, Kennan would still feel the purges as hammer blow impressions, each more outrageous and heartrending than the other. The effect was never to leave me. Its imprint on my political judgment was lasting. Rotated out of Russia in August 1937, Kennan did not return until July 1944. <clears throat> having, having by then, by 1944, been promoted to number two in the embassy, Kennan became an influential advisor to Ambassador Harriman. Despite the wartime alliance and the cordiality that Stalin had cultivated with Roosevelt and Churchill during the war, <clears throat> the post-1934 restrictions imposed on contact between resident foreigners and Soviet citizens had not disappeared. The restrictions had eased somewhat during the war, but they had not disappeared. In the long telegram of 46, Kennan put front and center the aspect of Soviet oppression that had frustrated his deepest desire. He wrote that the single, the single most disquieting feature of diplomacy in Moscow was the isolation from ordinary Russians and from Soviet policymakers, whom one cannot see and cannot influence. A variety, a variety of emotion-inflected issues figured in Kennan's long telegram of 1946, the Mr. X article and the containment doctrine that followed. Kennan and Harriman were appalled at the Soviets' brutal domination of Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe. They pressed upon Truman, President Truman, the necessity of blocking further Soviet expansion. Although the telegram was dictated by Kennan, feeling ill and lying prone as he dictated it, it had been commissioned by his hardline friends in the State Department. They knew that Kennan, already furious at both the US and the Soviet governments, was primed to deliver an eloquent emotional punch. In a recent letter to Washington threatening to resign, Kennan had fumed, fumed that despite his authority, objectivity, and courage on Russian affairs, Washington was sidelining him in a subordinate position. He was just number two in the American embassy. Meanwhile, Stalin, on February uh, 9, 1946, gave a major speech emphasizing Marxist ideology while shortchanging Allied assistance during the war. The State Department, in prodding Kennan, for his analysis of the talk anticipated a real deep one, one of his better efforts. Kennan did not disappoint. In the 5,000 word telegram, Kennan invo invoked in the name of realism, a fantastic scenario in which the Soviet Union, Soviet Union appeared as an inhuman force, without morality, unable to appreciate objective fact or truth, and compelled to destroy almost every decent aspect of life in the West. Russia was again, as in the 16th century, under the triumph, under the thumb, under the thumb of semi-Asiatic tyrants. After elaborating on this existential threat, Kennan, in his conclusion, tried to pull back. He, he assured that the Soviet Union did not want the war, differed from Nazi Germany, stood weaker than the United States, and could be contained without war if the United States and Western Europe instituted reforms. Yet it, yet it was his emotionalized depiction of the Soviet threat his militarized language that grabbed attention. He described the Kremlin as impervious to the logic of reason highly, and highly sensitive to the logic of force. Not surprisingly, many readers concluded that containment, <coughs> excuse me, containment required a massive military buildup. <coughs> in his Mr. X essay, published in Foreign Affairs in 1947, Kennan again de depicted the Kremlin as unapproachable, indeed as an insensate piece of metal. <coughs> 
<clears throat> the Soviet government behaved like a persistent toy automobile, wound up and headed in a given direction, <clears throat> stopping only when it meets with some unanswerable force. Kennan, ignoring the contradiction in logic, also stressed the need to contain the communist supposed tendency toward hyper-emotionalism. Any U.S. missteps, he said, would spark an exhilarating effect and a thrill of hope and excitement in the enemy camp. Indeed, Washington should aim to force upon the Kremlin a far greater degree of moderation and circumspection, leading to either the breakup or the gradual mellowing of Soviet power. <clears throat> given, given Kennan's long-standing criticism of U.S. society, it is not surprising that he concluded both the long telegram and the Mr. X article by stressing the need to tackle U.S. domestic problems. To avoid destruction by Russia, he affirmed, the United States needs only to measure up to its own best traditions. <clears throat> Americans should even, should even welcome the Soviet challenge as a prod for pulling themselves together. In sum, Kennan's arguments for containment reflected his long-standing impulses and concerns, namely his frustrated desire for contact with the Russian people, his resentment of Soviet repression, his personal aspiration, his determination to reform your society, and his hopes of reigning in the emotions of others, even as he channeled his own emotions. <clears throat> the long telegram in the Mr. X article met with such enthusiastic response by uh, response that Kennan was soon deploring the militancy of U.S. policy. <clears throat> By 1948, Kennan, now promoted to director of the policy planning staff, and the State Department was arguing that containment was already working and that the United States should start negotiations with the Russians, with himself as the preferred negotiator. <clears throat> as Kennan's skepticism about the Cold War and about nuclear weapons grew in the years after 1948, his influence, particularly under Secretary of State Dean Acheson, waned. In 1952, Kennan was appointed ambassador to Moscow, not to negotiate, but rather to discern Soviet intentions regarding the stalemated Korean War. As ambassador, Kennan tried in vain to ease the tensions that he feared were leading to a nuclear holocaust that would destroy his beloved Russia as well as the United States. After 1952, Kennan in private life became an eloquent advocate of engagement with the Soviet Union. He called for negotiations on Germany and nuclear arms uh, in his 1957 Wreath Lectures, later criti criticized the Vietnam War in the 1960s, and championed the anti-nuclear movement of the 1970s and 80s. <clears throat> how, <clears throat> how, Kennan, how Kennan thought about Russia shaped what he thought. The mix of emotion, personality, and cognition that infused his thinking helped produce evocative manifestos on how to respond to the Soviet Union. Of course, it was not Kennan alone, nor solely emotional factors that led the United States to adopt the containment policy. While Kennan's passionate beliefs, tortured introspection, and fascination for America's opponent in the Cold War seem made to order for emotions history, this category of analysis lends itself to other issues as well. While steering clear of emotional determinism, historians might examine how various emotional reactions, such as insecure pride, craving for respect, anxiety about change, and fear of appearing fearful, can aggravate cultural differences and make political compromise more difficult. Scholars might also ask how and why Cold War America adopted fear as a supposedly inevitable and even desirable frame of mind. Even taking into account such indisputably frightening elements as the atomic bomb, Americans in the Cold War seemed impelled to embrace fear. They worried deeply about the supposed security threat posed by a handful of communists or gay Americans, by far-off Vietnamese guerrillas, and even by rock and roll loving juvenile delinquents, quote unquote. With the doctrine of mutual assured destruction, the US government enshrined fear at the core of national security. Questions inviting an, um, an emotional approach abound, and I'll just finish up here in a few minutes. How have emotions figured in the thinking of the, in the, thinking of the leaders and the populace of various countries during foreign policy crises? To what degrees were these expressions of emotion genuine, feigned, or somewhere in between? How were prevailing cultural norms for displaying emotions gendered and racialized? How were feelings for uh, pride, humiliation, condescension, and contempt played out in the relations of Americans with the leaders and populations of such client states as South Vietnam and post-war West Germany. 
How does such emotional factors shift the changing political, economic, and military relations? What have been the roles of transnational friendships and socialization in fostering such supranational institutions such as NATO, the Warsaw Pact, and the European Union? To what degree did the rupture of personal ties help start the Cold War? Did a reknitting of such ties help end the Cold War? A final, final point here. Why should we study emotions history? Slippery and yet ubiquitous, emotions imbue life with meaning, purpose, and structure. Regardless of whether we choose to consider them, emotions remain central to thoughts and reactions, including, of course, your reactions to my talk this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting, but also, I would say, kind of unusual look at George Cannon. Yeah. You he was an unusual guy. Uh, yeah, that came across, yeah, definitely. <laughs> he was interested in containment, but also in sex, I dare say, and other uh, interesting things. Um, may I open the discussion? Uh, would, um, if people have a question, please um, indicate that. Yeah. Uh, yes. You talked about the personal identification he felt with Russia and almost wanting to become Russian, and he felt as though the uh, the government of Russia of the Soviet Union was the main thing getting in the way. Did he right. feel that, or do you feel, having studied him, that there were other factors and that he could have ever felt closer to that than he did? And then, to what extent did Cl closer to Russia? So to Russian identity, to him almost taking on that identity. I mean, and uh, then what extent did that haunt him later in life? Did he ever let go of that? Well, there's two questions. I, I, you know, let's say that absent the Soviet restrictions, would he then have lived in Russia? I, I don't know if he could have, he talked about it. He talked about it. I don't know if he would have actually gone that far. Uh, I think at times Kennan allowed his, his thoughts to, to, uh, to in a way, Get, get out of control. And I think in ways he spun things out to the perhaps logical conclusion, but he would not necessarily follow that uh, in, 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 you know, in, in a sustained kind of a way. So I don't know if he would actually would have moved. I mean, he could have defected. I mean, he could have done that. That would have been a tremendous coup for, for, for the Soviets, right? I mean, that would have. And of course, there's a famous, there's a, you know, Kennan's farm was in East Berlin. He had a farm. It was in Pennsylvania, East Berlin, Pennsylvania. He had a farm in East Berlin, Pennsylvania. It's not, not too far from Washington. And, and it's a true story, I mean, he, 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 there was a panic in the State Department when a lower level official reported that Kennan had, had gone to East Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so it, it, just, the second part of your question was what? Uh, to what extent did the failure for... Oh, did that haunt him later yeah. in life? Well, he, 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 he went back to Russia, uh, you know, he was expelled when he was ambassador in 1952, then he went back in 1964 and again in 68, and he went back and several times in the 1980s, and and, he, and and on those occasions he commented that what he had really loved in Russia was gone. I mean, it was the pre-1917 Russia that he loved the most, and he felt by you know the second part of the 20th century that the remnants of that were, were really gone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But by what you said, one would assume that he, in retirement as a private citizen, he would have gone back at least once a year. Mm -hmm. Oh, he didn't go back once a year. He went back on occasion. But he would, I probably went back about five or six times over the 20, 25 years to year. Isn't that surprising? Isn't that surprising? Well, I, I, as I said, I think the things he really loved, uh, you know, after when he was first went to Russia in 1934, it was only 17 years after, after the revolution, uh, 40 years later than that, things that changed enough. Okay, thank you. Uh, he could not have gone back on a regular basis in the 60s, for sure. The embassy no, would have had to have treated him as a special person, right. or they didn't want right. to no, see no. him. I meant later, in retirement. Place. But oh, my, my just say one, let me take one comment on that. Actually, he did go back in the early 60s, and there was a whole negotiation back and forth yeah. because he had been expelled, and he wanted to make sure that the Soviet government really wanted him to come back. His pride was at stake. Yeah, but these were very brief and very well right. calibrated. Right. Right. What I want to ask Art is whether he ever actually had multiple opportunities to talk with real Russians, not the all-nighters with Rodney. Uh, or, and you don't just walk down the street and talk with intellectuals. Did he ever get out in the countryside? Did he ever describe any events where he met people who were the Naruto the people? He did. He did. He did. And he How was did able he describe to describe them. He, 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 well, he, were he, they sober? <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. You know, he, he enjoyed doing that. On a Sunday, he enjoyed going into the taking you know, 
little tram into the countryside and, and, and just mingling with people and just listening to conversations. He also had an extended tour through Siberia in 1945 where he met lots of different people. Um, he, 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 could, he could, of course, speak Russian as, with, with no accent. So uh, he, he, he did do that and he enjoyed doing that. Of course, he wanted to do that even more. Thank you. Yes, please. <laughs> Um, I, I, I loved your talk, and this is a, a new dimension of Kennan for me, which is very interesting, but there seems to be a kind of contradiction in that um, he was perceiving and understanding the Soviet Union through the Russian people and the Russian culture and history, but officially he was dealing with what Soviet policy was, right. which was being made by these people who he perceived as standing between the Russian people and himself as a representative of the West. Um, why did he think the Russian people were so important in their policy if he understood at a certain level that the leadership in Moscow oh, no. was suppressing the real Russia? I don't think he thought that the Russian people were important in terms of shaping policy at all. In fact, he said that that was, they were not, he understood that they were not. It's that he longed to have contact with them, but he, the people he dealt with, of course, were the Soviet leaders, he understood that they decided things uh, on their own without any uh, really looking at how, what the Russian people wanted. And in fact, he said, he said at one point, that we really can't help the Russian people, uh, no matter what we do, the concessions we make to, to the Soviet government, those concessions or those trade concessions or whatever will not be shared with the Russian people. So, uh, no, he saw very much of a, of a divide between the Russian people and the Soviet government. Uh, I know there's some debate in the literature about whether or not Kennan was an anti-Semite. I was wondering if you could speak to that a little, and then also if he was, how that might have impacted his analysis and his judgment. Well, Kennan grew up in the early 20th century. And I think that's something you have to keep in mind. Gaddis talks about that, and I think he's right. Kennan grew up in the early 20th century when attitudes towards Jews were different than they, in the United States, were different than they were after World War II. Uh, I think Kennan's attitudes didn't change all that much. Um, and that's certainly true, that he, he would identify people as, as, as Jewish in a way that I think most of the Americans would. An example, two, two, I'll give you two examples. Uh, one, he taught, referred to the, the Monica Lewinsky, the, the Jewish intern. Uh, she, of course, she was Jewish, but I mean, the, the, most of us wouldn't think of that per se. And another, just a little thing in his diary, uh, he was walking down Nassau Street in Princeton one day, and there was a fire uh, in one of the houses, and, and he described a, a Jewish woman who was escaping from the fire. I mean, how he knew he was Jewish, I have no idea. But this was in the 1950s or 60s. So, uh, yeah, that was the consciousness of, that remained with him for the rest of his life. It was a category, it was a category that remained with him for the rest of his life. Yeah, please. Um, thank you, it was a really great talk. I just have a question about methodology and emotion. Uh, Can you first, speak up a bit? Uh, I just have a question about methodology and, and the study of emotions. First, how do you suggest to someone who's trying to get at this issue of emotions in, in a biographical context, with someone who didn't quite write as much as Kennan did, and let alone in a self-analytical way as Kennan did. Um, that's my first question. And then uh, just a brief second question is, it seems like in, in, in the talk, at least, there's elements of, of trauma and other sort of psychoanalytical concepts as a way to explain Kennan's actions throughout his life. But emotions, in some sense, are transitory, and that's the nature of them. They're ephemeral. And then how do you, and, and sort of imposing this structure of trauma or something along those lines makes them permanent. So how do you reconcile the right. fact right. that emotions? Two, two, two good questions. I think, for, you know, Kennan, as I said, seems made to order for emotions right. history. Right? But on the other hand, I just, based on the book I just did on, on uh, World War II diplomacy involving the big three, there is, you have, where well, I did a certain amount of emotional analysis there, we have people who are not as articulate about their feelings, but they are to some extent. I think it's one of those things, that, as with many topics in history, you know, where you look for evidence, you, you can find evidence that you wouldn't necessarily think is there. So I find that particularly in the 20th century, and you know, kind of post-Freudian or Freudian era, leaders do talk, many leaders do talk about how they're feeling, how, not that you take that at face value, I mean, that's evidence you have to interpret as any other evidence. Uh, or talk about other people's feelings, or, or uh, you know, just as one example comes to mind, 
uh, when Roosevelt went to the Tehran conference and the Yalta conference, uh, the Soviets had bugged the rooms where he was staying. Stalin wanted to know not just what Roosevelt said, but the tone in which he said it. So I mean, there's a way, and that's one reason for having those the summit conferences because the leaders wanted to interpret each other's uh, body language, and they saw that as as a uh, as a kind of a key or kind of insight into underlying political intent. That's how they interpret it. Um, so. When I commented in the second question about trauma, um, I use that term as, as, as traumatic stress uh, with intent because I think that was such an intensive experience for Kenny. Uh, the, and and the, the other, dip, Bolin and Thayer and these other people who were in Moscow during the purges, was a very intensive experience. No matter how, the evidence for that is overwhelming the degree to which they felt affected by it. And Kennan, as I, as I quoted him, and he's, this is in his memoirs, Kennan talked about the impact of those years remaining with him, and the impact of the, the trauma from those years. He, I don't know if he uses the word trauma, but certainly that's the, the sense of, of what he's writing about, that the impact of that trauma shaped, he says, shaped his political analysis. That doesn't mean we have, mean we have to accept that at face value, but I think that's, that's pretty strong. It's pretty strong evidence. Thank you. Michael Hunt. Yeah. If I enjoyed the talk, it's thought provoking. Well, I, I guess I'm trying to formulate a question about Kennan now. That, I mean, now that you, you were plunged into all these psychological and, and personal, kind of emotional issues. And I, I guess it, it, it comes down to this. It, it strikes me as, as, as sort of strange that this Foreign Service officer who is, you know, whose career mm -hmm. is to evaluate, analyze, um, not only has, but cultivates this very rich and self-conscious emotional life. And so, I guess my question is, I mean, there are two parts, really. Did, did he think that this was a problem, you know, in terms of the kind of expectations of a foreign service officer or a, a specialist in international affairs? I mean, people around him are not, I mean, you know, I think you know, we, we would agree that most of the most of his colleagues, you'd have to probe pretty hard. They're pretty buttoned down, right? And they're so, and you know, and, even, and I, my suspicion, you know, maybe you can confirm that Atchison, when he kind of ousted him, right, right. you know, said this guy's too touchy feely, right, and you know, right, like, right, you know, right, he's, a, right, right. he's a he's a bundle of emotions, and let's right, let's, right, let's right. get things under control. So Kinnan must, at some in some way, have recognized that that this kind of a rich emotional right, life that right. he, he's ready to put out on stage. You know, must have hindered his career. So, was he aware of that? And and how did people around? I mean, you know, I say in Berlin, you know, say, right. what about other people? Right. Who that, that's a very good capacity? question. Okay, two things. <clears throat> One, I think, is striking to me, and it's part of the paper that I cut out this the length. Um, it's striking that Kenan, throughout his life, admonished himself that he had to control his emotions. As a boy of of, of twenty, the boy of twenty, when. He, Dyer starts in 1924, he's, he's 20 years old. He says that he talks about, I guess, to strive for more equitable, um, even, even tempered emotional tenor. In his 90s, he says the exact same thing. And, and, and he says repeatedly that, you know, he often admonishes himself that at a dinner party, he was too, he was just went on and on talking you know, too much and was too excited and so forth. And he said, What's wrong? But he really, he, that was its goal. But he's also trying to contain and channel other emotions. I mean, this I tried to point out, kind of the long telegram and the Mr. X article that a lot of his writing is talking about that we need to, or, or the Amer book American Diplomacy. You go back and look at the, that book, what he's talking about is what's out of control in the American Diplomacy from 1900 to 1950, the emotions of the American people, which are interfering with right. what diplomacy right. should be. I mean, it's, so that goal of containing emotions is, is a constant in his life. Um, but by the same token, by the same token, what I think the interesting element here is, is particularly his intuition. You know, the part of Ken is, why was Ken regarded as a brilliant analyst? Because he, he could think, people saw him as thinking outside the box, and he can incorporate a whole range of knowledge, but knowledge garnered from different aspects, from, from experience, from intuition, from hard study. Um, he, and he could put it together in a creative kind of a way. And I think the emotions figured and the intuition figured in, in the kind of analysis that, that made Kennan a standout kind of person and that made Kennan, gave Kennan the standing he had. And then when 
Kennedy started advocating things after 40, started advocating things that people in the State Department didn't want to hear, then they saw that, that kind of quirky brilliance as quirky. That's quirky. Yeah. That's quirky. And, and I think, but I think what I've tried to say here is this consistency, I think, um, in the kind of the brilliant, what people regard as brilliant analysis or, or the long telegram. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fairy tale. It's a fairy tale. Uh, but yet people, because of what people wanted to hear, they accepted that whole mix of things that went into his thinking and went into his not knowing of Russia uh, in a way that they wouldn't, wouldn't later on. Thank you. Uh, late, late, later on, uh, Ken fell out with the Truman uh, administration, or the Truman administration fell out with him about containment. Uh, certainly, yes. And yes. Uh, did the Truman administration misinterpret his containment as he saw it, or did his own thought actually develop? Well, I think, you know, Ken, that's, why, that's one, one main reason why Kennedy picked Gaddis to be his biographer, because he, he believed, and he was right, that Gaddis would write sympathetically about Cannon's development of the containment thesis. I mean, this, this haunted Cannon for the rest of his life. I mean, for, for over 50 years, I believe that Cannon was really more at fault than he, uh, as, as I laid out in the paper, because of the way he phrased the long telegram in the Mr. X article. Of course, people interpreted it the way he did. Um, more military. Yeah, than. in a more militarized kind of way. Cannon, Cannon admonished himself for all kinds, criticized himself for many, many things throughout his life, but never, never that. Okay, thank you. Chris Browning. Yeah, uh, how did, in the diaries, did Kennan understand what was going on in the purges as opposed to how he explained it as an historian later when he's writing about Russia and his relationship to the West and Stalin preparing for a possible you know, uh, deal with Hitler? How, when he was right in the middle of that and his friends are getting killed, how, does, how did he understand it then? Uh, how did he understand what? The great purges. Oh, well, yeah, they, they were they were terrible. I mean, like, but did he they, have to know what? Did he have an explanation of why they were happening? No, I actually, you know, the, one thing I should say, one thing oh, I should say this because you won't buy the diaries when they come out. But the diaries are, are often in many many places disappointing because you're looking to see where. Okay, how does Kennedy react to that question board in September 1939? It's not there. The, the diary ends in June. Uh, what has Kennedy react to the stock market crash? It's not there. How does Kennedy, the most disappointing thing for me, how does Kennedy react to the end of the Cold War? Two sentences, not very, uh, not very, you, you or I could have reacted with more, and certainly Michael Hubb would have reacted with <laughs> more intelligent comment. So, um, the, it, there's not, in, in those diaries, a lot of what I have here is actually letters to his sister, uh, which are in some respects for the 20s and 30s more uh, informative than, than the diaries. That's why I'm going to have a long introductory essay to incorporate some of this. So, and there's nothing in the diaries that's very different in terms of his interpreting the purges of what I was talking about here. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get Mike Morgan, please? Um, I'm interested in the question of Kennan's intellectual trajectory over the course of his life, which yeah. you mentioned a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, Kennan goes from being the architect of containment in the mid-1940s to a critic of the way that containment is implemented in the 60s, 70s, critic of the nuclear arms race, critic of Ronald Reagan, and yeah. so on. Should we regard Kennan as consistent intellectually over the course of his life, or is the Kennan of 1946 incompatible with, inconsistent with the Kennan of 1986, let's say? Yeah, I'd say it is inconsistent, but he's. But I, but I, my point is he's consistent emotionally. Yeah. There's an emotional logic that carries through, and I think that's one reason it's important to study Kennan's emotions. There's emotional logic, emotional consistency, whereas there's, you know, Kennan of '46 is also very much a creature of ambition. He want, you know, he's been writing memos for years, and they've been mostly ignored. At least he feels that. I think they're not as ignored as he thought. He wants. God damn it! People to notice him, and when he gets this opportunity to comment on Stalin's speech, he takes the opportunity to write something that they will notice. I mean, as he says in the diary, in the memoir, uh, you know, he's going to let them have it. And personal ambition is really important here, and that, and another thing that's really important, I think, that Kennan, having been away from the United States for a long time, misjudged. The, the sentiment of the American people. He thought the American people were still in a kind of a Rooseveltian wartime Uncle Joe, uh, Stalin's, or as a wartime buddy frame of mind. The American public had shifted away from that uh, to some degree by, by 46. Certainly, the Truman administration has shifted away from that, and he thought he was. Kennedy, in a way, was, you know, pushing hard on a door that just slammed right open. 
Uh, well, he was lucky that was back that made his name. That made his name, but then he then he agonized over the results of that for the ensuing 50 years. I mean, in a way, you know, when you talk to students, they say, well, there was the long telegram, there was the X article, that was it. That made his entire career, his, right. his entire right. reputation. Right, but that's not what he that's not what he wanted. You know, no. that's that's not what he, he wanted. Again, what he thought, how does he end the long telegram in the Mr. X article? To change American society, to reform American society. And that's what he's talking about for the rest of the, for the rest, into the 1990s, he writes this book of personal and political philosophy that's published in, in 1993. It becomes a bestseller, becomes a bestseller, and, and, and it's amazing. He writes in the diary, this is a man now in his, in his, in his, into, well into his 90s. He, can't, he, he cannot understand that, that the Clinton administration and people in Congress are not contacting him and how they can implement the, the, the points in his personal philosophy. Uh, about change, in particular, he wanted to institute what he called the Council of State, which was a kind of a council of elders, very prestigious Americans, like somebody I can think of, uh, who would be the kind of the arbiters, or not arbiters, but they'd be the kind of the super, super uh, council of elders to advise the president, advise the Congress. And one way to get around the limitations of democracy, which he never had very much uh, faith in. So he genuinely believes that people are going to read his book and this is going to be implemented. Uh, and in 2003, when he's 90, 99, he says, well, if the Bush administration contacts me about Iraq, I, I know what I want to say to them, but you know, I'm, not sure they're going to, I'm not sure they're going to contact me. <laughs> and he's, he's, uh, you know, he's, he expected to be a world player, a world player. And, and all, his, all his achievements, his incredible achievements to him were nothing because they were next to nothing because he didn't get to do what he really started, had ambitions of doing as a, as a young man. This yeah. place. Not to avoid Biden and Irish when they come out, but does he have anything to say about how he committed a form of diplomatic suicide when he compared Stalin to Hitler? He does write about that, and that's, that's, uh, that's, that goes, the law, the law section. He to a higher office, that's not the right thing to say. Right, right. And that was. So what does he say? Uh, he basically asks, he, he excuses his behavior. Uh, he says it was just, he, what he doesn't see is that this was a psychological break. He was under such pressure that basically he, he, he snapped uh, in, in Berlin. And there's all kinds of evidence for that. But he, what he just does in the diary is he explains the circumstances of it and basically excuses his own, his own behavior. But his diplomats in the, uh, in the State Department some of them were ridiculed. There's a, there's a file in the State Department called, called Kennan's Silly Press Comment. <laughs> and, and silly is something George Kennan probably would have stung more than any other word. But uh, the various administrations did consult him. He was invited to the White House. And I found memos where they always said, George Kennan is coming. Be aware. He's a prickly character. I mean, that wouldn't have gotten him. Yeah, but they wanted the George Kennan's advice on whether to have this policy or this policy. Okay, what he wanted was a policy over here. Yeah. So it was advice on, on small issues, whereas he, he, he had big ideas. Yeah. Can you just, uh, towards the end of our session today, can you just talk about the end of his active diplomatic career, where he c committed quite a few uh, faux pas as well? Well, he was, uh, he was ambassador to Yugoslavia exactly. from 1961 to 63, where again, uh, he expected to significantly change that relationship, to really solidify U.S. relations with Yugoslavia and the Kennedy administration uh, would not cooperate in terms of uh, resisting Congress's refusal to pass most favored nation uh, trade status for Yugoslavia. And so he, he basically resigned, very disappointed with what had happened. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for a very good session. Thank you. Thank you.